everyone here today as you make your way to your pews. Let me see, Ms. Clark. Uh, uh, I would ask you to sign the friendship pad, which is located at the end of each pew so that we can have a record of who was worshiping with us today. Uh, we'd ask you to please say a prayer for Bobby. Uh, Bobby is at Camp Nakomi with, uh, let me get this right, 11 of our young people as they begin the confirmation process and we have three adult advisors with them and just let's just continue to pray that this is a meaningful time in the lives of our young people as they grow closer in knowing the Lord. Uh, another announcement, we want to highlight we did this at 8.30. We'll do it now. How many of you are coming to our Joy Gift Dinner? Raise your hand. Let's see them high. Beautiful. Put your hands down. How many of you have still not made reservations? All of you. I'm telling you. I know. All of you. Please make your reservations no later than Monday. No, you know who I'm talking to, by the way. No later than Monday. Uh, Chuck Ramsey will tell you the best event is going to happen next Sunday. It is our Christmas concert. Chuck absolutely loves the Christmas concert, and you will too. So please, please come. That is at 6 o'clock. All the choirs have been at hard at work, getting ready, and we are very excited. So that's all I have. You know, you can read. So any questions you have, the answers are here. Let's prepare our hearts, our minds, and our souls to worship the Lord. Fire burns. It hurts. It can destroy. Fire also gives warmth and light. The coming of Christ is both a day of judgment and a day of promise. Two candles flickering brightly help us remember that the coming of Christ has many meanings. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. Me. Light two candles, see them glow brightly, so that all may know how two candles show the way, making our darkness bright as God's day. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground, and righteousness will look down from the sky. Dear God, <laughs> we have much to do, and we are not sure we will be ready for the day of your coming. It advents light, help us to see what is important, to be, to be who you want us to be, and to do what you want us to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Samaritans worship what they do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Let us worship the Lord. Please be seated. It is now our privilege to come into the presence of God, into the light of his love, and into the assurance of his mercy. So let us come with all that we are, with all we've done, and with all that we've left undone to our God who knows us best of all and who loves us most of all as we pray our prayers of confession, first in unison and then in the silence of our hearts. Let us pray. God of grace and truth, in Jesus Christ, you came among us to call us to yourself. You came as our shepherd that we might hear your voice and follow wherever you lead. Yet, all too often, we have been blind to your presence, deaf to your voice, and rebellious to your will. Forgive us in our sheep-like ways. Take our timid faith and naive excuses. In your mercy, strengthen us with a renewed hope that we might follow and love you with our whole hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Hear the good news. 
By the power of Jesus our risen Lord, truly I tell you, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Please be seated and let the children come down. Here and let y'all just kind of come right around close by. Oh, so happy to see you all this morning. What a great bunch. Yeah, you can get closer if you need to. Some beautiful Christmas finery we have on. It's getting close, isn't it? Closer and closer, and doesn't the church look so pretty? And I bet your houses are looking pretty. Do, do any of you have uh, nativity scenes in your house? Yeah, yeah, me too, me too. And so I have two pieces of a nativity, two na different nativity scenes that I have. And I made this one a long time ago, and this one I bought a long time ago. Can anybody guess who this is supposed to be? Mary. Mary, yeah, you got it right off, right. For some reason, Mary always ends up in blue. I don't know why that is, but anyway, we know that this is probably supposed to be Mary, and we're going to talk a lot about Mary this morning. Here, I can pass this around. You can look at it if you want to and pass it from one to the other. Um, Mary was pretty special because, well, do you remember who her baby was? Who did, who did the angel come to Mary and say, hey, guess what? You're going to have a baby, and he's going to be a person named Jesus. Jesus right. He's going to be yeah. Jesus, the Savior of the whole wide world. So, you know, that was pretty scary, right? I mean, it was scary anyway uh, for Mary to be having a baby, but to be having, you know, somebody so important, it was wonderful and very scary. And so, Pastor John's going to talk a lot about that. But what Mary realized is, even though it's scary, I can count on God. God is going to get me through this, and it's going to be good. And in fact, when she realized how good it was and how special, she just went to her cousin, who was also having a very special baby, and she just burst out into song. She was so happy. Well, what do we do when we come to church, especially on Christmas? Do we sometimes burst out into song? It's because Jesus is with us and among us, and He just helps us to know how much God loves us, and that's a good reason to sing. It's a good reason to go and be like Jesus, too, because Jesus comes to us and lives in us. And Pastor uh, Dr. Hinkle is going to also talk about how Jesus is born in us, which is, you know, pretty cool. A little scary sometimes, but it's awesome. So, I'm going to fix my hands and close my eyes and thank God for, for Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good job. All right. <laughs> I like the way y'all pray. <laughs> Let us pray together. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for this heavenly food, that it may nourish us today in ways of eternal life, through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Psalm 72. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to a king's son. 
May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. <clears throat> May the mountains yield prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the needy, and crush the oppressor. May he live while the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations. May he be like rain that falls on the mown grass, mowed, I'd say mowed, but mowed grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days may righteousness flourish and peace abound until the moon is no more. May he have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May his foes bow down before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tar Tarshish and of the isles render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him. All nations give him service. For he delivers the needy when they call, the poor and those who have no helper. He has pity on the weak and the needy and saves the lives of the needy. From oppression and violence, he redeems their life and precious is their blood in his sight. Long may he live. May gold of Sheba be given to him. May prayer be made for him continually and blessings invoked for him all day long. May there be an abundance of grain in the land. May it wave on the tops of the mountains. May its fruits be like Lebanon and may people blossom in the cities like the grass of the field. May his name endure forever. His fame continue as long as the sun. May all nations be blessed in him. May they pronounce him happy. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his wondrous name forever. May his glory fill the whole earth. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, son of Jesse, are ended. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
This morning, our gospel lesson comes to us from Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 40, 56. I invite you to open up your Bibles or the Bibles provided for you as we listen to God's holy word once more. We hear the words of our Lord. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to the town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of the Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who believed that what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm, he has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He brought down the rulers from their thrones, but lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants now and forever, even as he said to our fathers. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months, and then she returned home. My friends, these are the words of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. O oh, Heavenly Father and gracious God, we truly give you thanks for this day, for the opportunity to gather together as the body of Christ and to seek your will for our lives. And as we gather in this room made sacred not by our presence, but by the presence of your Holy Spirit, we pray that your Spirit would move us, that it would shake us, that it would transform us. So open up our minds so that we may feel your love. Open up our hearts so that we can understand your work in this world. And now, Lord, may the words from my mouth and the meditations from our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Henry. Oswald Tanner was an American artist and the first African American who ever got international acclaim for his work. Tanner was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1859. His father was a college educated AME Zionist minister who was one of the leading abolitionists in Pennsylvania leading up to the war. His mother was born in the rice fields of Virginia as a slave, but as a young woman found the courage to escape through the Underground Railroad. Tanner's middle name, Oswald, is to represent the village in Kansas where free soilers were massacred, both women and children, and fathers and sons. Tanner, at a young age, would be accepted to the Pennsylvania School of the Arts he would be the only African-American student at the time. Now even though his professors said that he showed great and amazing talent, he could never grab a foothold in the Pennsylvania art world. So he made the decision to move to Atlanta, Georgia and start a photography store off Auburn Avenue. But even in that venture, he failed. But it was while he was in Atlanta, he caught the eye of the president of Clark College, which is now Clark Atlanta University. The president was so amazed at his talent, he paid for Tanner to travel to Paris. And it was in Paris, France, that Tanner found his muse. Some of his work that you might be familiar with is the arch, which is found in the Brooklyn Museum of Art. Gateway Tanzir, which hangs in the St. Louis 
Museum of Art. And probably his most famous painting of all, The Sin, which hangs in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. But the work that has always fascinated me was Tanner's painting, The Annunciation. In your bulletin, you will see, we printed out, Charlotte got it printed out for you, The Annunciation. And so you can look at that as I continue on. But here's the thing. If you were to Google painting and annunciation, one would find that an abundance of European painters have done their very best to paint this, this moment we find in the Gospel of Luke. The problem comes is the way they paint Mary is that she is a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, ivory-skinned young woman above the age of 20. If you would look at her facial expression, there is there's not this fear that we read about in the Gospel of Luke. It is almost as if she is fawning at the good news that she is going to have a baby. Never mind having a baby and being an unwed mother was not a good thing in first century Palestine. And then there's the angel Gabriel. He's depicted no better. I mean, he looks like a kissing cousin of Mary. He too has blonde hair, blue eyes, that ivory skin. And he looks chiseled like he works out at Gold's Gym. Now listen, I'm just being honest with you. I am very proud of the C minus I made in my art appreciation class at Presbyterian College. I earned that C minus. And thus, I consider myself an expert when it comes to the fine arts. And therefore, I can tell you that most artists paint what they know and who they know. So it shouldn't surprise us that these paintings of the Annunciation look like it is a sunny day in the Bavarian countryside. But not Tanner's painting. In Tanner's Annunciation, we are invited to witness this holy moment covered not in the bright sun of the day, but in the shadow of the hour. Mary is raven hair. She looks very Jewish no older than the age of 12 or 13. Take a look, because the first thing that grabs me is that she holds her hand tightly, as if in that moment the only person she can hold on to is herself. And then there is her facial expression. It is clear what the angel is telling her is not that she has won life's lottery. Her facial expression is that of, of fear. Not terror, mind you, but fear. The fear that we have when we face the unknown. And then there's Gabriel, God's divine messenger, delivering a divine message. Gabriel is neither male nor female, but reflects the very one who sent him. Radiant light divine light. And his message? That within Mary is a son who will come into the world to change the world whether the world wants to be changed or not. This morning, we continue our series of sermons, listening to the songs of Advent. We focus our thoughts on Mary's Magnificat, but before we get there, we first have to understand why she sings in the first place. She has been told by God's divine messenger that she, this 13-year-old something young woman, is going to be a mother, never mind the fact that she has never known a man. And her son will not be just any child. But he will establish the throne of David forever and ever. She is going to give birth to the one Israel prayed for all these many years. She will bring into this world the Messiah. 
Now, I think one of the mistakes we, we often make as believers is we try to domesticate the nativity and all the events leading up to this moment. To make the story more comfortable to our needs and our wants, we want to control the narrative instead of having the story shape us and change us. We will even rewrite the story to fit our story. And we do this to Mary all the time. We want to make Mary fearless and faithful where she truly is the example of what it means to be a servant of God. We try to convince ourselves that she faces this moment without fear. But such an attempt to whitewash the gospel ignores the angel's words to Mary. Be not afraid because Mary, Mary is afraid and she has reasons to be afraid. One of the things we're afraid of is that too often we equate fear with faithlessness. But Mary, Mary is afraid, but that doesn't make her less than faithful. For the truth is, and I'm believing this more and more, that fear might be the start of faith altogether. For some of you, you know this. I am afraid of heights. Deathly afraid of heights. I just need to watch a movie or a YouTube video of some daredevil doing some de death defining stunt way up high and my heart, it starts racing and I start panicking. I really don't know long, how long I've been afraid of heights, but as long as I remember. This is why this event is so out of my character. But there was one afternoon while we were still living on Bobby Drive when I climbed a tree in our backyard. I don't know why I climbed the tree. My memory says that there was a ball stuck up there and I got the bright idea that I could get it down. So I shimmied up to that first branch, and then the second branch, and the third branch, got the ball down, threw it down, and I kept climbing. And I was very proud of myself, by the way, very proud of myself, until I got to the very top. And I looked down, and I knew that there was no way I was getting down. So I screamed out to my father, who was working in the backyard, and he came over to the tree, and he asked me, what was I doing in that tree? And I told him. And then I told him I couldn't get down. And you know what he said to me? If you got up, you can get down. Now, on a side note, that's exactly what he would say to our cats all the time. <laughs> but then my father said to me, You've got this. You've got this. And I've got you. So I found the courage to move my right leg and search for that branch below me. And then I lowered myself and I found the next branch and the next branch and the next branch until I was on the ground. It would be years later when I became a father. And remembering this story of me climbing the tree, it dawned on me. You know what the one thing my father did not tell me? He didn't tell me that I wouldn't fall. Gabriel doesn't tell Mary she will not fall. Gabriel tells Mary, you've got this. And God has got you. Mary sings the Magnificat. It is her song of faith in the face of her fear. In Latin, the first verse of Mary's song is translated, My soul magnifies the Lord. It is also important to note, this is the actual Greek translation also. 
Now, usually I don't get in translation battles when it comes to this Bible or that Bible, like which Bible is the better Bible. But personally, I, I read from the NIV. But here I believe the NIV got it wrong. Because instead of using the word magnify, the NIV translates it as glorify. Now, for me, glorify says more about our outward expression of faith. For example, we are glorifying the Lord every time we gather here at the corner of College and Spring to worship God. We glorify the Lord when we hear Jesus call us by name into this world to give ourselves to the least of these. I am all for glorifying the Lord, but magnifying the Lord is something different. When we magnify the Lord, it is not done from the outside. It is who we are in the inside, deep within our souls. A soul touched by the Creator, created by the Creator Himself. This is what's growing in Mary and will be born into the world. Therefore, when we magnify the Lord, it is, I believe, that spark we must have if we serve God in our communities. It is the very ability to trust the Lord even when, and especially when, we are afraid. Afraid to come down from that tree. Afraid as we face the unknown. Afraid when we realize that God's will for our lives not might be what we want or desire. Afraid, yet even in our fear, we find the faith in the courage to sing our song known to us as we too experience Jesus. Fully God. Fully man. I think this is why Karl Barth's words in the church dogmatics have always resonated with me. He says that the nativity is a holy mystery. It is conceived from the Holy Spirit and it is born out of the Virgin Mary. Meaning that God became human and at the same time, God is God. The miracle of the existence of Jesus, his, his climbing down from God, His Holy Spirit in Virgin Mary. Here is a human being, the Virgin Mary, and as Jesus comes from God, Jesus also comes from this human being. Born of the Virgin Mary means that Jesus has a human origin story. Jesus Christ is not only truly God, but Jesus is also human like you and me. He is human without limitations. He's not just like us. Jesus is us. Jesus is not like us. Jesus is us. When we magnify the Lord, when we sing our songs of faith, I tell you, it is Jesus who is born in all of us.
My dear friends, like the saints who've gone before us, let us stand and confess what we believe using the words from the brief statement of faith. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching the good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with the outcasts, forgiving the sinners, and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, and delivering us from death to life eternal. Now, my friends, let us continue our time in worship by giving our tithes and our offerings to the Lord.
Oh, gracious God, we are truly humbled, for we recognize that all good gifts have come from your hand. And so we pray that we can use this tithe, this offering, to continue the good work of Jesus Christ until he comes again. For we pray all these things in his name. Amen. Please be seated. There is so much in this world that frightens us. And yet one only has to look towards this table to find hope and peace and comfort. That even as we walk on this journey towards Christmas Eve, we know that God has got us. Let us prepare our hearts, our minds, and our souls to receive the Lord's Supper. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Loving Father, Holy God, we thank you and we praise you for the gift of life that you give us this day, the life of the good earth, the life of your eternal spirit. We thank you especially for Jesus who brings those two together and to us. We thank you for giving us everything, even your body and your blood broken and poured out for us. We thank you for these elements that nourish our bodies. We thank you for your spirit that nourishes us for eternal life. Send your spirit and bless these elements that they may be true communion in the body and the blood of Jesus, communion with you and communion with one another. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. According to the gospel on the night of our Lord's betrayal in an upper room with those he loved the most, his disciples, he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples saying, Take eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he passed it among his disciples saying, this is my blood poured out for you. The blood of the new covenant given for you. Take, drink it, all of you. My beloved, I tell you the truth. Whenever we eat of this bread, we drink from this cup. We proclaim the saving death of a risen Lord until he comes again. So I invite you to come. All who have heard Jesus call you by name into this world, come and eat and know grace and mercy. For I tell you the truth, this is not a Presbyterian table. It doesn't even belong to us. This is the Lord's table. And all are welcome.
according to the Gospel of Luke. One day the angel Gabriel came and visited Mary. And she was afraid and had every right to be. But the angel said, do not be afraid. And so Mary made her song known. My soul magnifies the Lord. Pray with me. Oh, Heavenly Father and gracious God, we are ever so mindful that we are not perfect people. We're constantly doing those things which we know to be wrong and leaving undone those things which we know to be right. Even when we strive to live a holy and pious life, we fail every time. And therefore, we are so grateful that you love us with perfection. You wipe away our failures, our faults, our mistakes, and you love us for who we are, your children in need of your grace and mercy. So we can boldly pray the prayer your son taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. There is a a lot to be afraid of. We live in a a scary world. Just as the angels spoke to Mary, his words are still the same. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. So go. Go with God. And go in peace. And may God be with us all until we meet again. Amen. Go in peace.